Back to what might be the last video on the 68 Twin before you get to hear, you know, them all played in one big video. The Fender Fest, I've promised, and I'd like to thank everyone for the positive response to yesterday's very long, hour-long video on this app where I showed a lot of the work being done. You know, it's hard to know what people really want, and I have done a lot of long-format stuff, and in that, you tend to show the same thing again and again and again. So I've been trying to focus more on unique aspects of each app and, you know, or just one aspect of, of an app in each video to break it down into manageable chunks. But apparently there is a demand for the longer format stuff as well. So I'll be alternating as I go. I'm still trying to find what the best way to uh, fulfill the audience's needs are. You know, maybe I need a, a talking dummy. Oh, wait, I am one. Anyway, uh, the faceplate on this was bent up here, and I did not show this in yesterday's video. In fact, I forgot. I meant to do it before I put the knobs back on yesterday, uh, and then I realized that I'd forgotten to do this. So I took the knobs back off, and I took the jewel off and the, everything off and straightened this. And uh, I did not show that in this video, but I will show how I do that when I do the 60 uh Five Super Reverb, which also has a bend in its panel. It's, its bend is down here. This one was up here. Uh, that happens when things get stuck on the Tolex, you know, in the cabinet, just kind of jammed in place and then pulled and it just flaps out. So it was pretty simple to do, and I'll show that in the next one. Let me show you some of the other stuff that's done on this app. You can see it's been recapped. Uh, MOD, so 7070, these are in series with each other with some 2 watt Vichy uh, metal films, 220Ks there and across each cap. And people have asked about what these caps and resistors do. You have two 350 volt caps in series, which gives you a total handling there of 700 volts because the B plus unloaded can exceed 500 volts and most individual caps are rated for 500 volts. So use two in series to get a total handling of 700 volts. But left to their own devices, they won't have exactly half the available B plus on them. Let's say that the B plus unload is 550 volts. You're not gonna have uh, uh, 275 and 275 volts on each one if you just have the caps in series. So we put these resistors across each capacitor and the two resistors force the voltage to divide equally in the middle because they're 220K, 220K. That's a one-to-one -one voltage divider. And so by doing that, we would have exactly 275 volts per capacitor. And that way one capacitor is not bearing all the load and each one is going to last longer, run cooler, because heat is a thing in capacitors, though it should not be in this situation because the, these caps are going to be well below their uh, maximum voltage in the circuit. And then two, uh, sorry, three 20 microfarads. These are 500 volts and the uh, one, one K and the 4.7 K. And uh, when I do this, I've shown this in depth before multiple times. I take everything out and I clean the board, all gold solder out. The new leads are bent under, just like I showed yesterday on the bias board, the bias and rectif rectification board. And there's a little bitty dab of silicone underneath each cap uh, for two reasons. Well, it's the same reason. On the old one, there was a, a strip of foam inside the doghouse cover, which pressed down on the caps, but that was pressing down on the old caps, which were much larger. So that foam no longer contacts these capacitors. So we want to have these capacitors held in place so the strain is not on their leads because uh, cap leads can break off right where they join the body if they're stressed. So since we can't easily put that downward pressure when the uh, doghouse is in place, I just put a little silicone, which holds it in place the same way from the bottom. And uh, when it's time to change these out, that silicone peels right off this fiber board. It does not want to stick. I mean, it stays in place until we want it to, to, to go, but then it comes off very easily and barely leaves any residue at all and that little bit of residue would be covered over by the new capacitor going in place. So it's kind of a win-win. And uh, I cleaned the chassis just to get some of that zinc oxide powder off. Uh, you know, just happens. It's the galvanization reacting to moisture 
in, in the atmosphere. It's pretty much unavoidable. It's not a real problem electronically unless it gets in pots and jacks and stuff, but it's nasty for the owner to, you know, touch the amp and come away looking like a, a 17th century courtesan. Here you can see the output tubes have these new Belton uh, retainers, just like I showed in the previous video, but now all four of them are in place and they're all tight, which is m much nicer than where we were. Um, these tubes are not particularly well matched. I think we're going to get a new quad of 6L6s for this amp. Um, may I may or may not show any details of that before you get to hear this thing for real, but it's not that important. You know, changing 6L6s is... is pretty standard stuff and the bias stuff i tend not to show on here because i do biasing a very dangerous way in terms of i'm dealing with the actual primaries and high voltages present on the output transformer and i don't feel comfortable showing that in a youtube video because if someone watching were to try that themselves without understanding everything involved they could easily damage themselves or the amplifier it's just not uh, uh, a level of uh, online teaching that I feel comfortable with as far as liability goes. I mean, I wouldn't be liable legally, but I, I personally would feel terrible if someone hurt themselves trying to do what they saw me do without understanding everything. And it's, it's a kind of thing you need to learn in person or through lots of careful, careful practice and understanding bits of it before you start playing with the, the high voltage act. Here you can see the new cable gland. Pretty much all the fenders I get in, I put this kind of cable gland on instead of the old kind. This is an old one made by Heiko, and it compresses in a very, in just one direction, really just clamps down. And you have to have a special tool to get them in and out. I have that tool, but I don't like these. Uh, they're very imprecise. They put an awful lot of force in one axis of the cable. This is a newer style gland made by Heiko. And this, let me show you one outside of the amp. This one has three parts and it has these little teeth here with a little neoprene ring inside. So you put the cable through on one side and then that this end tightens. And as it tightens, it clamps those teeth on all sides of the cable at once. And the other side, this passes through the chassis and tightens up here. Now you can install it like this, so it's like the, looks like this from the rear. It comes out from the app more that way, about that much. But it can be loosened, Very actually comes out a bit more than that. But it can be loosened from the outside very easily, whereas this is much harder to do. You can't loosen this very easily with, with, with your fingers once it's tightened. And so I don't install it this way, I only install it this way. I like these very much. Now there are several different sizes of these available. I get them from Mauser. Uh, this is the size that fits an SJT uh, AC cable, which is, I believe, 10 amps. Uh, there's the SVT style cable, which is not like the Ampeg. It's just the higher current rating for 15 amps, which is not really necessary for an amp like a twin. Most guitar amps, you don't need the SVT. The SJT is fine. But for the larger diameter SVT, you do need the larger diameter one of these uh, Heiko uh, clamps, and you have to have a larger opening in the chassis. So, you know, it's, if you like using these, these old style, go for it. There's nothing wrong with it, as long as you have a proper tool for that. And uh, I have two of them, but here's, here's the one I use most of the time, because it's uh, smaller and easier to keep on the bench. Anyway, that's a very secure connection, almost flush to the chassis. And yeah, if someone's like, hey man, I wanted a Heiko, it's still a Heiko. Down here, you can see the new AC power cable safety ground is here. The new bias chassis connection is here. The HT and uh, shield for the power transformer are here. And the four new cathode wires for the uh, 6L6s are here, 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 and here, and here. New 3 watt 470 ohm uh, screen grid resistors installed on each tube. I um, have not biased it fully yet uh, because I'm, I know I'm going to change the output tubes, but it's biased safely. It's about 55% right now. In the first video, I mentioned that uh, some wires were missing here um, from the 68 because I forgot that the, this amp would have had the half cathode bias circuit that they did in the uh, AC568 or whatever it's, the, that model number was called. 
I'm terrible at remembering sequences of numbers and letters, sorry. Uh, and I was incorrect. The, the previous AB763 circuit did have a straight wire from the cathode to ground. These had uh, resistors from cathode to ground, and they had wires going over to this side where they had those uh, caps mounted across some of those caps were both uh, across the resistance of the cathodes to ground and balancing this pair to this pair. It was a very complicated circuit, totally unnecessary. I don't know why they did it. This sounds better. And so this amp has been much more, uh, is much more like the AB763 at this point. Speaking of which, this amp originally had 68K bias resistors here. One here, and then one going to this board and then connected to this pot via probably a 10K resistor. I don't remember what the circuit was. And whoever blackfaced the app had just taken the 68K resistor and folded over to here. So it still had 68K, 68K. Uh, and this amp uh, with the output coupling caps and 68K would have a little bit less low end than it does with the 68K, uh, 220K. So I've got 220Ks mounted here and here. None of that sloppy excess, all that uh, lead dress has been cleaned up very nicely. And again, like on some other amps I've done recently, you can see an additional filter cap added to the bias because the amp had a very low level hum without this in stock form. And adding this uh, made uh, that hum go away. And how that works is the AC secondary from the power transformer goes to here and then goes through this 470 ohm resistor. It was a 1K in the 68. I've changed it back to the 470 ohm from the AB763. Uh, that it very, very slightly lowers the AC voltage and gives you a little bit of current limiting. There's no real difference between a 470 ohm and a 1K in this circuit. But also forms, I mean, it forms a slight divider with the rest of the stuff, but it, half, a, half a K doesn't make any difference as far as that divider goes. Then it goes to this diode, and the, the diode's anode and cathode arrangement is such that only negative voltage can go through. So the DC here is negative, and we have a bias cap here, which is filtering off uh, any ripple or a large amount of the ripple. Not all of it. That's why we had that hum before. Anyway, so we have a filtered but not perfectly filtered a negative DC here. And that also goes off to the tremolo, but it also goes off to the bias pot. And it goes to this bias pot, and this is the input, and this is the wiper, and this is the the uh, output, let's call it that. And this is, you know, lugs one, two, three. So the input is lug three, wiper is lug two, and then lug one has this resistor going to ground, and the ground is the shell of the pot. And I took this pot out and I cleaned all the surfaces and really got it nice and clean and tight, so it's a good ground. And so this is a 10K pot, and this is a voltage divider setup, unlike a Marshall, which is used as a varistor. And so you have 10K of play here. And then in this case, it's a 22K resistor to ground. Um, so you have a total of 37K uh, here. Is that right? 24, I don't know, I guess 22. So 32K total, and only 10K of that varies. Anyway, that's you can look at Uncle Doug for more on that. But the reason adding this 22 microfarad cap to the wiper, which feeds the uh, bias leak resistors we just talked about, and then hence the grids of the power tubes, is so effective, it remo removes that little bit of extra ripple, is because there's resistance between lugs 3 and 2, the input and the wiper. Uh, typically, this pot will end up somewhere in the middle of its range. So let's just say... Typically, it's somewhere in the middle of its range, so there may be 5K here. So 5K separation here decouples this stage from this stage. So we have a root. This is connected over here with this cap to ground. So this has one le level of filtering. And if this uh, trim pot were turned all the way down so the two lugs were electronically equivalent, you would just have 47 uh, microfarad and 22 microfarad. So you'd have, you know, 79 microfarad or whatever it is, 69 microfarad. Um, but because there's some separation from the resistance of the pot, that creates a dropping resistance and an additional new node, and that's very effective. That resistance removes hum in addition to this cap. This is a very surface-level explanation of this because you really need to read books on how this stuff works, or at least long chapters. 
but it's that it's not just adding this res, uh, capacitance to that capacitance. It's separating the two capacitors by the resistance there. And it doesn't matter that it varies. Depending on the tubes, you may have that set to 5K, 7K, or just 3K. In fact, you can see the later fender circuits where they did add a 3K resistor from here to here. There's actually a little tab uh, on the bias pot that this trim pot lacks with an additional uh, cap to ground. So Fender incorporated this idea in the 70s. And not every idea they had after Leo left was a bad one. That was a good idea, and here's how to implement that on this app. The value of this 22K resistor may change when I get the new output tubes and I would really worry about what the total bias range should be. It may end up being a 15K, it may end up being a 27K. I won't know till I get there. When I first evaluated this amp, uh, one of the things was that the tremolo was extraordinarily weak. I could hear it trying to work and I could see the light bulb on the roach flashing. You can't see it flashing now uh, for reasons that will soon become apparent. Uh, but uh, it was just really extraordinarily weak. So, you know, I changed out this capacitor, changed out these three caps. I verified the values of all the resistors in that circuit. They were all good. I tried a different 12AX7 for V5, made no difference. But I could see the bulb was flashing. So I knew we had at least uh, a problem in the caps before. After changing the caps and all that with the old roach in place, we had tremolo, but it still wasn't very deep. And I could see the bulb flashing from that end of the old roach. But I knew that the LDR on the other end just wasn't uh, going all the way open and all the way closed the way it's supposed to. So I changed out the roach. This is one from Tube Depot. These come with a little excess uh, length to the shrink wrap, which makes it kind of an awkward fit on these. I trimmed that back and I have them in place. And I'm gonna show you the uh, nice deep trim that we have now with all the new components here and the changed out roach. So that's nice, isn't it? And now I'm gonna show you what I like to do at this point, we turn the amp off. I know I kicked the camera, so it's not gonna line up exactly with the previous shot, but uh, this roach inside this shrink wrap is two parts. We call the whole thing the roach, because it looks like a bug. On this side, there's a neon bulb. On this side, there's an LDR, which is a light uh, sensing resistor, and it changes its resistance based on how much light is present. Uh, these come in this uh, shrink wrapping, but it's very loosely applied. And I know that right now the bulb and the LDR are lined up properly. So I like to go in there. and shrink it a little bit more. Now I know they cannot move. They won't move in relation to each other and that will stay nice and strong. I'm a bit finicky, but I think in this case it does pay off. And the last thing to consider on this amp are the speakers. Now this has a badge on the front of the grill cloth that said this amp originally came with some JBLs and those would have been fantastic, albeit very, very heavy. But as you can see, they are long gone and these uh, mismatched Fender Fender labeled speakers are in here and they sound okay. But the owner also provided a set of warehouse G12As, which are some really honking big, powerful Alnico speakers. And I think we at least deserve to hear them. I know what these speakers that are in there now sound like, and they sound good, but they're kind of generic. Let's put in those A's in the next video and take those for a spin. I think it'd be worthwhile to see if it's a good fit. I think it will be interesting at the very least. I have not played a twin into a pair of powerful Alnico speakers. No, I'll take that back. I'll take that back. I've played some Eminence Eric Johnson's that are Alnico, big honking 90 watt Alnicos. Uh, and those sounded fantastic. Let's see how these uh, warehouse big powerful Alnico, Alnicos sound. Cause we can always, I can always put these old ceramics back or we can go to a different kind of ceramic. But uh, I think, uh, 
think this might be the next level tonal recipe. We'll find out. Thanks for watching.